in the American Civil War, there were many breakthroughs in technology, both on land and sea warfare. And let us go to the date, March 8, 1862, to the Battle of Hampton Roads. That day, an ironclad ship defeated several wooden vessels. And the next day, March 9th, was fought the first naval action in history between ironclads. And here we have that story. The American Civil War started on April 12, 1861. And soon the Union Navy started a full blockade of the Confederate States. That was Operation Anaconda, which sought to stop the Confederacy from exporting cotton, tobacco, and other goods to European markets, and at the same time preventing the Confederate States from buying European weapons. Precisely, that naval blockade takes us to the Battle of Hampton Roads. By 1862, Confederate forces controlled the southern shore of Hampton Roads, while Union controlled the northern shore, including the powerful Fort Monroe, a fortification which covered the exit to the ocean. And along with her ground units, the Union troops had a squadron of warships to cover the area. On March 8, 1862, that squadron had five warships. To the west of Fort Monroe were anchored the Frigate Congress and the Light Frigate Cumberland, while to the east also anchored were the frigates St. Lawrence, Minnesota, and Roanoke. All of these were unarmored wooden frigates, while the Minnesota and Roanoke were new hybrid frigates, and that means that those ships had sails and new steam engines which powered a propeller below the waterline, while the other three warships only used sails. The two hybrid frigates had 50 guns each, while the two sailing frigates had 44 guns each and the light frigate 24. In total, the five Union warships had 212 artillery pieces, a substantial amount of firepower. Furthermore, at shore, the Union troops had several coastal batteries, and with all of those artillery pieces, the blockade seemed impregnable. But precisely, on March 8, 1862, at around 12 p.m., from Confederate-held Portsmouth, left the response against that blockade. That day, the ironclad CSS Virginia left its berth it was her maiden voyage, and that ship immediately set out to confront the Union flotilla. An hour later, at about 1 p.m., the Confederate vessel was sighted by the two closed Union warships, and one Union officer described the Confederate ship as, it looked like a roof of a huge floating barn, and from its chimney rose a black column of smoke. But that floating barn had the Confederate flag, and the crews of the Union warships were called to battle stations. Action was imminent. But right now, let us go back in time to the summer of 1861. At the start of the war, the Union Navy had to retreat from the shipyards of Portsmouth, which by that time were the largest Navy facilities in the United States and unable to take every ship with them, Union sailors had to burn nine vessels, and among those was the brand new 40-gun hybrid frigate Merrimack. The fire consumed the superstructure of that ship, but its hull and engine machinery were saved, and the Confederates decided to use it. But they created a floating battery by adding a wooden casemet covered with iron, that was the birth of a brand new ironclad. But the enormous weight of that superstructure allowed only 10 artillery pieces to be installed. A meager battery. But by February 17, 1862, that ship was launched and christened the CSS Virginia. 
And as stated before, a month later, on March 8, 1862, was her maiden voyage. And now it had been sighted by the Cumberland and the Congress, where the crews were called to battle stations. Those three vessels were about to engage in mortal combat. Slowly, the Virginia approached, and soon that vessel was within range of the artillery of those two frigates, and also of the guns in several shore batteries. And all available artillery pieces opened up. There were 32 guns in the ships, plus many more on the land batteries. But at that distance, all the projectiles that hit the Confederate vessel simply bounced off. The Confederate ship continued to close in, and faced with that reality, the two Union frigates should have sailed away to start a long-range artillery duel. But the Union vessels were dead in the water, because there was no wind. Meanwhile, the Virginia's advance continued, and at 2.20 p.m., that ship's bow gun fired a single shot at the light frigate Cumberland. And that projectile penetrated the wooden hull, and a cloud of splinters killed and wounded many soldiers. Shortly after, the Virginia passed alongside the Congress. That Union frigate continued firing, but with no effect. And as the Confederate ironclad passed by, it fired a broadside of four artillery pieces against the Union warship, which caused a lot of damage. But the Confederate captain pressed forward against the light frigate Cumberland, because intelligence report claimed that that ship had brand new Parrot rifle guns, and those were considered the most dangerous weapons in the Union flotilla. Under intense fire, the Confederate ironclad pressed on without serious damage. And finally, it happened. The Virginia bow hit the starboard side of the Cumberland. To compensate for its limited artillery, the Virginia had a ram in its bow, an implement not seen in a warship since antiquity. And it worked. The Cumberland had been mortally wounded and began to take water. But the Virginia ram got stuck, and now the Confederate ship was unable to back off. Meanwhile, the guns in both ships thundered. Firing at point-blank range, the Cumberland's guns damaged an artillery piece on the Confederate ship and killed and wounded some Confederate sailors, and also pierced the Virginia's funnel, reducing that ship's speed. But despite that damage, the armor of the Confederate ship remained impregnable. Still, the Cumberland was sinking, and it almost took the Virginia with it. But finally, the Confederate ship freed itself when its ram broke. Now, the Virginia moved away. At 3.35 p.m., the executive officer of the Cumberland gave the order to abandon ship. That frigate sank and took with it 121 sailors. Now the Virginia slowly moved against the Congress. At this time, the wind had kicked in and the Congress had started moving. But it ran aground and now was trapped. Shortly before 4 p.m., the Confederate ironclad stood at a mere 180 meters from the Union vessel and it started firing. All this time, the Congress artillery had thundered, but its fire had no effect. Instead, now the projectiles of the four guns of the Confederate ship started to demolish the Union warship. And after suffering a lot of casualties, at 4.20 p.m., the captain of the Congress hoisted a white flag. The Confederate ship began a rescue operation. But as that operation was underway, Union shore batteries opened fire on the Virginia, killing and wounding both Confederate and Union sailors. So the rescue operation was ended immediately, and the Virginia withdrew. But before leaving, several red-hot projectiles were fired at the Congress, and that wooden ship began to burn. During all that time, the other three Union frigates had tried to close in. But first, the propeller-driven Rannoch and the sail-powered St. Lawrence ran aground near Fort Monroe. 
While the propeller-driven Minnesota had traveled further upriver when it also ran aground. And now that the Congress had surrendered, the Virginia headed for the Minnesota and fired a few rounds against it. But it was already late and the tide was receding. So at 5 p.m., the Confederate ship withdrew and later on reached her harbor. Without a doubt, the Virginia's first day of action had been a resounding success. Two of her guns had been damaged and most of her external fittings destroyed. But it had sunk the Cumberland and left the Congress burning. And the Minnesota was close by, stuck in the sand. Thanks to her armor, the ironclad Virginia was still in fighting conditions and its casualties, less than two dozen men killed and wounded. The next day, March 9th, the Confederate ironclad left port once again. This time, to finish up the Minnesota, which was still aground. But as it closed the range, the Virginia was surprised by the USS Monitor, a Union ironclad which had arrived to the scene on the 9th of March 8th. And this ship had been specifically designed to fight against the Confederate ironclad. Soon the artillery of both ships thundered, and they fought for several hours. But the projectiles bounced off each other's armor. The ironclads were impregnable. Then both ships tried to ram each other, but the Virginia was too slow and cumbersome to hit the little monitor. On the other hand, the monitor did hit the Virginia, but the Union ironclad was too light and had no real effect. Finally, both ships' captains gave up. The battle between the Virginia and the Monitor had been a draw. Well, the Monitor Ironclad had a very interesting innovation. An enormous turret capable of, of rotating 360 degrees to face an enemy from any direction. And I must point out that the ships with turrets were the future and from that moment on, numerous variants of turret ships were commissioned in many navies. But as important as the turret was for the future of naval vessels, I want to point out that the action of the previous March 8 was recognized by the Union government as a complete disaster. They lost two frigates and 200 sailors. And that enormous defeat was the product of technology. Technology represented by the steam engine and layers of armor. The Battle of March 8 showed that sail warships had limited value and that wooden ships were no match against ironclads. Iron plates and engines were the future. But I must point out that the Virginia and the Monitor had a great drawback. Those ships were floating batteries. The sign for coastal defense and had not been designed to travel in open seas. In rough weather, they could sink, as happened with the Monitor. Months later, as Union ground forces began their gradual advance to the area, the Monitor was sent south to be part of another blockade. But on December 31st, it was trapped in a storm and sank. And as a side note, the end of the Virginia occurred when that ship was burned by its own crew, when the Confederacy was forced to abandon Portsmouth. That was the fate of those two early ironclads, but the armored ship was here to stay. As simple as that. Well, I hope that you liked this video, and if you did, please give it a like or join my channel. That is of great help. Also, I have a Patreon account where you can support me, and in that account, I have opened a small store where you can buy PNGs and GAPGs of art pieces that I will be producing and selling here in my country, Guatemala. Regards, Victor Aguilar Chang.